Welcome back to the panel discussion, Innovation in Government, Cyber Leaders on Cloud Security, sponsored by Kerasoft on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. My guests today are Jonathan Fibus. He's the Chief Information Security Officer with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Andre Mendez, he's the CIO, the Chief Information Officer at the International Trade Administration Bureau, Department of Commerce. Katie Lewin, Federal Director, Cloud Security Alliance. And Ned Miller, he's the Public Sector Business Unit Sales Executive for MVision Cloud at McAfee. Before we went to break, Andre came up with a provocative uh, point, and that was everybody get rid of your desktops and laptops and we all go to mobile, small, tight devices to use uh, in the execution of your daily duties. Uh, Ned, I see you chomping at the bit to talk about that. Thoughts? Yes, so I concur with Andre. I think it's a, um, a movement that's been underway for quite some time. Um, from McAfee's perspective, as an example, we talk about security from a device to cloud strategy, mm -hmm. and our customers have to think about their overall cybersecurity strategy in that um, vein where the device can be anything uh, going forward. Um, mm -hmm. So I suspect that, like Andre, the uh, workforce of the future will be accustomed to working uh, anywhere, anytime, anyplace, and as a result, the form factor of those devices will substantially change um, be much more portable with plug and play. And for those of us that are accustomed to keyboards, we'll have, we'll have keyboards that'll plug into those smaller foot, footprint devices. Or have large fingers. Or and have large you, fingers. You bring up a good point though, um, the, 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 the way in which these devices are structured and utilized in the future will mm -hmm. likely change as well, making yes. it much easier. Jonathan, you wanted to chime in. Yeah, mobility is a core tenet of our program. We're trying to get people to be able to work wherever, whenever, however, with whomever. And the important thing there is we don't want to have multiple devices because with multiple devices, I've got some data here, some data there. Using the cloud, it's all in one place. It's much easier to get to. And if I have a way that I can plug my phone or my tablet or whatever device I have that hasn't been invented yet into a large display, I can collaborate with my whole team. Uh, plugging it into a mobility network, which the phones and tablets are already part of, allows me to collaborate with my whole team wherever they are. So I think we're going to see fewer and smaller devices with more uh, accessories that allow us to not have to worry about the size of our fingers. So this gets back to the culture idea and mm -hmm. also people who are younger being more agile with those kinds of things. So, you know, um, working at home was such a novel idea when I was coming up, but now everybody does it. I mean, you go to the office maybe, depending upon where you work, several times a week, several times a month. Um, I've worked at places where my boss was in Florida and I saw him like once a year. It's totally different than what it used to be when I started. Uh, so I think that culture is going to also make this a more acceptable idea to your really your clients who are the people who are looking to you to set up an infrastructure in which they can do their jobs. And I wanted to bring something else up. You asked about what's the worst thing you were talking about with, well, yeah. in my mind, the worst thing is continuous monitoring. In my, it, my feeling is we have not mastered that at all. I mean, it's a great idea. It's something that I think is the sort of the end point to, secure, to ensuring security. But my feeling and my um, opinion is that Agencies and even cloud service providers have not really mastered how to not only collect that data, but report it to their clients in a meaningful way that is timely, can be addressed, and yet doesn't, you know, sully their reputation and, and be a problem for the cloud service provider, but yet addresses um, the issues that come up. We talked about this particular issue on one of our previous panels, mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested in hearing from you why you think this hasn't caught on as well as you think it should. I think there are two reasons. One is the data reporting, at least, and I haven't looked at stuff for a while, but the data reporting I don't think is in a format or in a mode or um, in a way that gives it the right level of urgency. So there are lots of things that happen that could be called breaches or intrusions. Not all of them are fire drills. 
So I think that there is a problem in the way the data is conveyed to the people who have to act on it, number one. And I also think that um, agencies are not trained, perhaps, to look at that data in, in, as levels of information. I mean, mm. that's one thing that I think is a problem. I'll play counterpoint Thank uh, you. to that, if you will. Yeah. So slightly different perspective. So we're a cloud service provider, and we are heavily invested in FedRAMP. Mm -hmm. As a result, we have to provide continuous monitoring as part of being FedRAMP uh, credited. And as a result, we've become very proficient at the reporting and the uh, indicator of compromise sharing with customers when it happens, if it happens, et cetera. I think automation has taken a key play um, which allows us to um, be much more proactive than what we ever have been mm -hmm. when the agencies were doing it themselves. Right, right. So back to the whole FedRAMP program and the automation that's required for us to maintain our compliance there, that's changed the landscape incredibly, mm -hmm. plus the number of tools that have come out that allow us to automate and script a lot of the former manual processes that were mm -hmm. involved in certification yeah. and accreditation. We now skip right ahead to the, to the end result and we've got really good filters to reduce the level of noise to the point that when we have a situation and we let our customers know, it's something to be concerned with. So from, from our perspective, uh -huh. um, as we've shifted the burden of responsibility from the agency to the cloud service provider, right. the FedRAMP program's working. Mm -hmm. It really is. And Interesting. I would, I would say that there's a little bit of a difference been from my perspective because I know that the cloud service providers are doing continuous monitoring of the entire instantiation of the cloud service. They've recently, and in some cases not so re for a while, have been providing me the data that I need for my uh, continuous monitoring as well. So it seems like a two-stage process. And I would say that I agree, FedRAMP has definitely done a lot to, mm -hmm. to make that mature in a short period of time. Andre. So, um, and I think this brings a couple of these issues together. Uh, continuous monitoring is an excellent concept, right? Because, uh, you know, y you have to make sure that you're looking at your environment on a constant basis and really figure out what's going on there. But the problem is, at what interval? And when you talk about at what interval, you get into resources again, right? Do you look at it every month, every week, every day, every hour, every minute, every second? And the moment that you get it reduced to, I don't care if you tell me a week from yesterday, a week from today, that I'm being breached right now, it doesn't matter, right? And so more and more with the number of endpoints multiplying, with the amount of data growing exponentially, or actually, you know, probably double exponentially, uh, with all of that multiplying, it is almost uh, you know, inevitable, it's inexorable, uh, that artificial intelligence would actually be the, uh, the answer to this, right? Because it's the only way that you're actually gonna do constant monitoring. It's the only way that you're gonna monitor all of those interactions. Uh, especially because you know, as the technology continues to evolve at a, uh, you know, a rapid and ever accelerating pace, right? All of the concepts of how we do business today might seem awfully antiquated and quaint, you know, not 30 years from now, but five years from now. That's how fast it's going, right? So what you, I found it interesting that one of the first things that everybody, you know, to, talked about when we talked about going to the, to the, uh, to the uh, phone, right, is but how do we get to see it and the size of your thumbs and everything, right? Uh, you know, that's not going to happen in a vacuum. What's going what's to happen is you're going to have retinal displays. Mm -hmm. You're going to have, you know, uh, wet interfaces into your brain, uh, you know, that basically allow you to not have to type uh, right. so that you're interfacing with cloud-based resources from a neuronal standpoint and that that data is going to be displayed in a retinal display with multiple depth of perception and everything else uh, where, you know, all of the things that we do today become just totally and completely um, antiquated uh, and, and no longer relevant. So, you know, and, and invariably we, we are, you know, uh, very short-sighted when it comes to technology, mm -hmm. right? At first we tend to over, uh, overestimate what it can bring to the table, but in the long term we actually underestimate what it brings to the table. And so what you're going to see is a total and complete transformation in the way that we do business and the way we interface with data, computers, applications, and everything else. Uh, and it will require a whole different set of protocols, a whole different set of security standards, a whole different set of, uh, of education 
um, that today um, is just not, not okay. there yet. But we got to look at that as the end point, the inexorable end point. The adaptation to mm. that and the adoption of those practices and, and policies and the technologies that's coming out, is that going to take place just as quickly as everything else is speeding up? The pace of change going to take care of that? Or is that going to require a different um, treatment? Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's all driven by necessity, right? I mean, so a adaptation is driven by uh, the old Darwinian principle of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, adoption, uh, no, uh, ad adaptation, absolutely, absolutely right, and evolution, right? And evolution requires evolutionary pressures, right? So as companies adopt this circumstance and visionaries adopt these circumstances, right, people who do not will fall behind very, very quickly. That is the history of three, million, three billion years of evolution. It's not gonna stop now, and it's gonna to continue to accelerate. And so uh, we, you know, it's, uh, we, can, we can have philosophical discussions about whether it should happen, all right? But the reality is the evolution has always been ruthless, right? It has always been sometimes, uh, you know, um, uh, difficult to adapt to. But those that fail to adapt also fail to survive. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be true in business. Okay. Uh, you know, it, is, it is becoming true in business today yeah. when you think about all the way that people are leveraging uh, you know, these technologies. And the fact that the, you know, if you look at the five, six, seven major companies throughout the entire world, they didn't exist 25 years ago. Okay. That's interesting, as always. Thank you. Um, before our time expires, I want to talk about a few best practices and uh, a few items uh, with an eye towards the future, and I'll start with you, Jonathan. What do you think are the best ways that cloud service providers can work together uh, to ensure systems and data are secured, uh, and given this move to the cloud? So from a government perspective, um, giving me predictability in what services will be available to me and how those services will be secured, um, the FedRAMP framework gives me a lot of uh, security and a, a comfortable feeling that my data is going to be handled appropriately. And knowing that there are different security levels of FedRAMP, it makes me know that I can tailor controls or send my data someplace where it gets extra attention as needed. Uh, continuous monitoring data as the reporting improves, uh, and it will continue to improve over time, uh, gives me great uh, comfort that there won't be breaches or that I will be prepared to handle those breaches before they occur. And the fact that I'm able to better uh, focus on my endpoints, my end users, and work them through the changes that are going to come to their working environment mm -hmm. so that I can focus my security staff on getting the data to the cloud, protecting it on the endpoints, and ensuring it's available for everyone to get their work done. Ned, focusing on that question, climb up and take a peek over the horizon and take a look at what you see and answer that question in that context. Sure, I think you'll see a, a broader intersection of threat intelligence data coming together to formulate more of a predictive analytics capability, leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning. There'll be more collaboration across the vendor industry as the CSA does today which will allow us to get more out in front of the problems so that we can telegraph to customers areas to look forward to um, before breaches are actually happening. So I think you'll see more crowdsourcing of data, uh, leveraging of automation, AI, threat intelligence. There'll be a lot more automation in terms of our predictive ability of being able to mitigate some of the risks as they come, come forward. And you'll start to see that over the, the course of uh, 2020. Just a quick detour, just for a brief answer. Trusting the machines that are going to be engaging in the AI, how do you, how do you write that script? Personal belief is that we have to be cautious in terms of over-investing in our belief that that will be the sole way that we're going to achieve the outcome that we're looking for. Because our adversaries are also using those technologies mm -hmm in a very different vein, right? So um, cautionary note, but it is the wave of the future. We will have to create new defenses to be able to um, uh, combat against the adversaries that are also using that kind of capability. Okay, Katie, mm. your view. Okay. CSPs and agencies working together, 
um, over the horizon, the out years? What do you see? Well, I think we've made a lot of progress. And thanks, everyone, for the FedRAMP um, praise, because I do think that was a good platform for agencies and cloud service providers to work together. But when we started this whole thing of FedRAMP, we got a bunch of cloud service providers together. And the two problems that they came up with, which really surprised me, were interoperability and portability. And those are still bugaboos, issues, um, challenges that need to be worked on and among that community of cloud service providers and agencies. I don't have the solution for that, but I think that we have started in stuff that maybe was easier. So now um, they're gonna tackle the two things that have really been obstacles since the very beginning. So I think that's what's gonna be worked on next. In terms of the um, technologies of the future, everyone you know likes the next bright, shiny objects, which are artificial intelligence and blockchain. So Cloud Security Alliance is getting into that in terms of research. I think, um, like you said, it's not, neither of those is the silver bullet that's going to solve everything. But I do think that those are the two things that are basically going to come up in the, let's say, um, near to middle future. Okay. Andre, just a few thoughts quickly before we close on that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, to look to the future, it does as well to look to the past uh, and, uh, and specifically to uh, evolutionary uh, theory. And uh, what you're going to see is a total and complete uh, adoption of abstraction layers at every single uh, part of the technology stack until we are only strictly focused on the highest level. Uh, that we need in order to do our job. We no longer think about the mitochondria that exist in our cells and that power what we do as human beings, okay? We stopped thinking about that a long, long time ago, right? What we think about is neuronal activity. So artificial mm -hmm. intelligence is going to come to the forefront. It's going to provide us with, the, with, the, with some uh, security by virtue of pattern recognition and so on and so forth. The challenges will be enormous. Uh, right. You're going to see us adopting to mimetism, but we are going to continue to evolve, and that's the only truth. All right, thank you. Great conversation panel. I'd like to thank today's guest, Jonathan Feinbus, CISO at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Andre Mendez, CIO at the International Trade Administration Bureau, Department of Commerce, Katie Lewin, Federal Director, Cloud Security Alliance, and Ned Miller, Public Sector Business Unit Sales Executive for MVision Cloud at McAfee. I'm your moderator, JJ Green, and you're listening to Federal News Radio, a part of the Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com, search cyber leaders.